please turn to page 54. We are now at narrative writing stage four. Let's review those four pages so that you can see what's on them. First of all, we always begin with a chant and this chant is going to be story opening, then actions, 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 where the character will do, say, or think until the story's done. I'll come back to that and I'll rehearse it with you and we'll go through each part a little slowly. I just wanted to show you what that is. So now we have stage four, story opening. We had learned that in stage three. Actions, actions, actions. That was in stage three as well, where we were now mandating that we had some transitions, not in every sentence, where the character will do, say, or think. This is our new teaching point here, and that is where we're going to actually add dialogue where we will use quotation marks. So we're going to add that, that dialogue with uh, punctuation. And then finally, the story is done. When we do the story is done, you're going to find that we will have a secret formula for that. So our secret formula is SC arrow at the beginning, and then at the end of our story, the story closing, the story is done, we're going to have TCR, transition character reflection. And again, I will go through all this in detail as we go through the lesson. So we know now, we have our story opening, we learned SC arrow in stage three, actions, 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 with transitions if needed, but we now need to add do, say, or think so that we can add dialogue with quotation marks. And then the story is done. That will be our new teaching, TCR, transition character reflection, to add a sophisticated ending to our story. On page 55 are your at a glance steps. So you have your story opening, your actions, 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 and the story is done. You have all the steps for those three parts of the story. That's what we're going to follow as we walk through our lesson. Now let's look at the next pages. On pages 56 and 57, we have the descriptors, exactly what are we going to be teaching when it comes to content and organization at the sentence level and for mechanics in the stage four lesson. So you have that outlined, which I spoke of uh, earlier with the chant. You also have your narrative writing stage four chart that you could make. As you can see behind me, I have a sample of that chart and you have on the page what it looks like in full detail. The story opening is green, the actions are yellow, and the story is done is blue. So again, the color coding stays the same. We're just increasing the sophistication, the rigor of their writing within this stage four format. Right next to it is a sample of an organizer, what an organizer story would look like. Notice on this story, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sentences. You never know how many sentences are in a story because you're writing it for meaning, not telling the children how many they need. So this story went on and on until the kids felt like it was done. And then finally on page 57, from their organizer, they were orally rehearsing it and then they were writing it out. And this is a sample of the student writing. So we reviewed all four pages in your manual for stage four of narrative writing. Let's go back to page 55. Your teacher at a glance steps to follow as we walk through these steps to form a story. Start with a blank piece of legal size paper, fold the paper. So when you give this to the students, just take a big old stack, fold it so they already have the fold and you can do these whole group lessons. Up here on the top is going to be our story opening. Then we have actions, actions, actions till the story's done. Remember, you may have a lot of actions, so just turn over to the back side if you need more action boxes and you just keep going until your story is done. The tools that we will use are going to be our do, say, and think for the actions in our story. We will also have our five senses or emotions or personality of a character cards for fancy words. You'll have your salt and pepper shaker to add when you have the fancy words, the adjectives. And also we have emotion cards we could choose if we need to, if we need to help to come up with what happens next in the story. So now let's walk through our steps. So first thing we do is we say our chant. We're going to be writing a narrative story at stage four. So we have story opening, then actions, 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 where we do say or think until the story's done. What are all the parts? Story opening, then 
Actions, 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 where you do, say, or think until the story's done. So on our teacher at a glance, you have your story opening steps, your action steps, notice you have do, say, or think added, and then the story is done. And now we will also be using our secret formula TCR for this stage four at when our story is done. I've written imaginative stories for the last stages, so I figured I would do a personal narrative because these steps work for a personal narrative or imaginative narrative, it really doesn't matter. So what you can do is you can have different kids tell things that have happened to them, and then you can choose one of the children's story, and then you can use that story whole group for the kids to write down. And I always say, if we're gonna use someone's story, do we care? No, why? because this lesson is what we're using to learn how to write stage four to learn the steps. We don't care about the story. We care about having a good story, but we don't care if we use someone else's story because for our personal narrative because we are learning the steps. So we go like this. Once we learn the steps, we can write our own story. That's right. We're going to write a personal narrative and we need our story opening, but before we start, we have to figure out what is a personal narrative. So a personal narrative is a true story, so I make the letter T, about myself, that's memorable. And then we all do that together. What's a personal narrative? A personal narrative is a true story about myself, that's memorable. If it's a true story about ourselves, we, that's memorable, we have to figure out, well, what's our true story? And what does memorable mean? Well, memorable means something happened to us that was true that made us have an emotional reaction. So we may be writing about something that happened to us that really scared us or made us really happy or made us sad or made us proud. So we're looking at something real that happened to you that gave you that emotional reaction. So then you'll have all the kids talk. Sometimes you may just want to share one that you come up with and they use your story. So this is a story I had heard the other day in a classroom, and one of the kids was talking about how he was out camping with his family, and he was running around the woods, and he was running around trees and climbing over rocks, and then he landed in a bush when he jumped over a rock. And what happened was his leg got stuck in some branches that got all tangled up in there. So when he was trying to pull it out, it wouldn't come out. So he's screaming and yelling, and his dad heard him, so his dad came and got him, and his dad's trying to pull him out, and it wouldn't work. And his dad had to pull the branches apart and finally his leg came out. And he was so thankful his dad was strong enough to do that, that's for sure. So he told his story, everyone listened, and then I always have the kids clap afterwards. We go, lovely, lovely. Now we're going to take your story that you told and we're going to use our steps, our story opening, actions, and the story is done steps in order to write it out. So the only difference between an imaginative story and a personal narrative, teachers, is that the personal narrative is something that happens, so you tell the story to refresh yourself. Oh, this is what happened. Now you go back and you follow the same steps in order to write it out. What's the first part of our story? Story opening. Over here on our organizer, we're gonna go to step one, get organized. So we're in the story opening, step one, get organized. Secret formula time. We already know this secret formula because we learned it in stage three. So the kids are gonna write SC arrow. Setting, character, action, and we write that down. Step two, character. Who's in the story? Who's doing the action right at the beginning? I am. So even though that boy told the story, all of us are going to pretend like we were um, the one who had been stuck in the bush, so we all write I on our organizer. Now we go back and we say setting. When and where did this story happen? And the boy says, oh, well, it happened to me early in the morning. I was running around early in the morning. So let's make a sun come up, like the sun's coming up. One morning. And now, where did it happen? Oh, down by the lake. I was over at the lake. My family and I were camping over at the lake. So let's make a lake there. And look how we're making quick, simple drawings. You never want to write out a ton of words on an organizer because then what do the kids do? They spend all their time writing words instead of thinking of ideas. And then you'll have different kids going, I'm not done, I'm not done. Simple, quick drawings. And I do a whole thing where I go, oh, look how I'm making a simple drawing. See my son? I just made a simple son and I did it quickly because that would be embarrassing to take a long time making an art project. This is writing. We all know that. We would never spend a long time drawing it out 
Never. How embarrassing. Now let's go ahead and draw our sun quickly. Look how quickly everyone's drawing it. So I always do that. I set it up so you don't have kids taking forever with the drawings. We have our setting and our character. What do we do once we have our setting and character? We're going to rehearse the sentence and act it out. So let's pretend like the sun is rising. So we go like this. One morning down at the lake, I, ready everyone? One morning at the lake, I, so you notice every time I say it, I may say it a little differently. It doesn't matter as long as it makes sense and it sounds right. We go to our last step, action. What was I doing one morning down at the lake? And then we may ask the boy again and he's saying something like, oh, I was running around. Now, I want to make this sentence a little more sophisticated. Instead of just saying, I was running in the woods again, then we would say woods again and it just is sort of a boring opening. So I want kids, instead of telling, I want them to show. I want them to have the reader really see them in the woods running. So I may say something like, okay, what were, go to the woods when you were running. Did you run around something? Did you run over something? Did you climb things? Did you crawl into things? What were you doing? And he's like, oh, I ran around trees. Okay, let's draw a tree. So let's put an arrow around the tree. So you ran around a tree. What else did you do when you were in the woods when you were running around? Oh, I climbed up rocks. So you climbed up a rock. Uh-oh. And then is that when you jumped off and you landed in the bush? Mm-hmm and landed in a bush. So let's put that bush there. One morning at the lake, I ran around trees, climbed up rocks, and then jumped in a bush. We have our whole story. So now we go run around a tree, climbed up a rock, then, so you're not doing all these at the same time. I can't use the word and. If I use and, then I'm running around a tree, climbing a rock, and jumping into the bush at the same time. So I ran around trees, climbed up a rock, then jumped into a bush. There we go. So we're going to use our word then. So we can remember that. Let's go back and let's add some powerful verbs. That's the most powerful part of speech. Everyone knows that. Say that to your buddy. Ready? Verbs. That's the most powerful part of speech. Everyone knows that. So when we go over here to our actions, instead of saying ran around the tree, what other ways could I do it? Were you crawling around the tree or did you dart around the tree? <gasps> darted. So we darted, he darted around the tree. What did you do? Did you go up a rock or climbed up a rock? Climbed up a rock, climbed. And then what did you do? Then I jumped into a bush. So let's put jumped there. One day, down at the lake, I darted around trees, climbed up a rock, then jumped into a bush. That sounds pretty good. Let's go ahead and add our punctuation because it's our starter, it's our story opening sentence. I usually like to do the punctuation right away. So we have one day. Let's write the word one so that we can remember to capitalize one. One day, down at the lake. What do I put after my setting when I have a when and where? What do I put? I put a comma. Notice I said down at the lake. I didn't say near a rock or um, in a bunch of bushes. I said one day down at the lake. When you're doing your setting, the where, it's always the big location. Okay? So one day down at the lake, I darted around a tree. Ooh, let's put a comma. Climbed up a big rock, comma, then jumped into a bush, period. We have three verb phrases to make our sentence more powerful, and we've added our punctuation. I'm showing this as an option. You don't have to do this. This is just another way to keep kicking up those sentences so that you have more sophistication in the writing. We added our punctuation. Now we're going to go back and see if we need to add some fancy words. What in this sentence needs to be described. What is really important? So I darted around trees. Do they need to see the trees? Okay. Let's say the trees are important. So we'll put an X there. What about the rock? Sure. What about the bush? Sure. That's, that's important to describe that bush. Those are the things that I want to see them 
I want my reader to see me darting around, climbing and jumping because that's the action. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing something towards these things. So it's important for the reader to see it. So let's go back and add, what kind of tree would I be darting around? So maybe tall trees. What kind of rock did I climb? Maybe a big rock. So I have big rock and maybe the bush because there were so many branches in there, it was really thick. So we'll have thick. Now let's go back and read it. One day, down at the lake, I darted around tall trees, climbed up a big rock, then jumped into a thick bush. All right, we have our story opening. Story opening, check. Now what do we need? Actions, actions, actions. So now we're gonna go to our action steps where we have draw an action box. What are we doing in these actions? Our character can now do, say, or think. Now we have our do, say, or think cards. When we have our actions, the character may be doing something, saying something, or thinking. This way we can add more to our writing where we have that dialogue or thoughts. So we go over here, we draw our action box, and we have to ask our sequencing question. What happened next after I jumped into the thick bush? So there's our sequencing question, and I'm using while or after. Well, I'm not jumping in it the whole time. You jump and it's done. So you jumped into the bush, so after I jumped in the bush. And I'm repeating that action. So kids know how to sequence. They stay on topic by learning how to say this sequencing prompt. So we say it again. What happened next after I jumped into that thick bush with all those branches? Once we sequence, then we're just going to talk about what happened next. So what happened next? My foot got stuck in a branch. Okay, so let's take our foot, and then we have our branches, and we have our bush here. And here you are going, oh no, my, fo my foot's stuck. Oh no. So now we have our picture with our idea. Go back, and we need to form the sentence. How do we do that? Always go back and reread. Then when you get to the new sentence where we haven't come up how to say it, you as the teacher do not give them the sentence. You just say, who's doing the action? And then action, what's happening? Let's go back. One day down at the lake, I darted around a tall tree, climbed up a big rock, and then jumped into a thick bush. Who's doing the action? Well, I could say I. Really, it's my foot is doing the action. So I could say, my foot, what about my foot? My foot got stuck in a bunch of branches. Okay, my foot got stuck in the branches in the bush. My foot got stuck in a bunch of branches. Instead of saying stuck, what's another word I could use? Because we want to have a powerful verb. <gasps> Maybe what happens when you have everything wound around your foot? Is it free or tangled? So many times what I do is if I know kids don't have the language, I just give them two choices, one that's not correct and one that is. Sometimes I give two words that are correct and they choose the one they want. All right, so I said, is your foot free or is it tangled? Oh, it's tangled. So let's write tangled here so we can remember that word. That sounds pretty fancy. My foot got tangled in the branches. We have our sentence. Now we'll go back and see if we want to add a transition. We want to see, do we want to say where? Deep inside the bush, my foot got tangled by its branches. Ooh, I could say where. I could have a wind tra transition. After I landed in the bush, my foot got tangled in its branches. I could have a sound effect. Snap, crackle. My foot got tangled in the branches of the bush. So we will decide we may want to have a sound effect or maybe we want to use a when or a where. It's really just giving kids different ideas. Are looking at my foot got tangled in the bushes. So now let's decide on which transition we want. Do we want a sound effect, a where transition, or a when transition? Let's do a sound effect. Snap. Crackle, my foot got tangled in a bunch of branches. My foot got tangled in the branches of the bush. So notice what I'm doing. I'm constantly going back and forth, back and forth, rehearsing the sentence until I like it. 
That is revising through oral language. Instead of having kids write things out and having to keep writing, they should keep revising as they read their organizer. We have our uh, action. Now what are we going to do? We're going to say what happened next. Ready? What happened next after my foot got tangled in the bush? So let's see. I could have another action. I could say what happened next. Or I could say something or think something. What did you do next? Oh, we have a say. All right, let's draw our template. So when you have dialogue, you're going to put a template on the page so that you include punctuation. We have our action box. We draw a line with a comma and our big dialogue bubble. We're going to practice what is it that you said? So we're only filling in the dialogue bubble first. We'll go back and draw and write the marker. That's the like I shouted, I cried, I screamed, I said. But first you only do the dialogue so that your marker will match. We go back and we say, all right, let's what would you say? Your foot's stuck. What are you gonna do? So you have all the kids come up with different things. And maybe we had, help, I was swallowed by a bush. I'll say, okay, let's practice saying that. Ready? We're going to put our punctuation. Put a quotation mark in the air. Everyone go. And then talk. Ready? Help, I've been swallowed by a bush. Close quotation mark. We're going to practice that one more time. Help, I've been swallowed by a bush. Let's go to our paper. Draw your quotation marks. We're going to write HELP and we're going to capitalize it and we're going to put an exclamation point there. That's an emphatic statement. Everyone go, emphatic statement. Ready? Emphatic statement. Those are words that can stand on their own. Words that can stand on their own. Usually because you're shouting or it's usually some sort of a sound effect, something that where kids can see that they stand on their own. So what do we have? HELP. That can stand on its own. So we have HELP. I have been swallowed by a bush. Now, I like to teach kids when we first do this to write the whole thing out. Did I say it or yell it? Yell it. So I have close, I have an exclamation point, close quotation marks. Eventually, I just put two quotation marks, a starting and ending, and I put a couple of keywords there, and I don't have the kids write it out once they learn how to do this punctuation. So I have, help, I've been swallowed by a bush. I have the kids push their papers next to each other, their organizers, and I have them do the following. They say to their buddy, do you have a quotation mark? And then they say, prove it, show me. Because when I say, all right, look at your buddy's organizer, did they put their starting and ending quotation marks? What's interesting is many kids will push their papers together and then they won't even look. They just look around. So I always have them say, prove it, show me. And then once I say, do you have quotation marks? Then the child would point. When they hear prove it, show me, they would point on their organizer, just like here. Here's my starting. Here's my ending quotation marks. They have to show that. As they're checking their punctuation with each other, I'm walking the room to make sure that that's been put correctly on their organizers. Once we have their help, I've been swallowed by a bush, once we have what they've said, then we go over and write the marker. Who said this? I did. And how did I say it? Did I giggle or did I cry? I cried. Let's put cried. We go back and we say the whole thing. One morning at the lake, I darted around a tall tree, climbed up a big rock, then jumped into a thick bush. Snap, crackle. My foot got tangled up in the bush. My foot got tangled on, in the branches of the bush. I cried, help, I've been swallowed by a bush. So maybe because I said T bush up here and bush here, maybe I just need to say my foot got tangled in the branches. So I'm modeling that to the kids because woo, 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 redundant police, redundant police. I don't want to keep saying bush, bush, bush. So I've said bush here, here, and here. Let's take this one away. Now let's go back and reread it. So look how we're revising. One morning at the lake, I darted around tall trees, climbed up a big rock, then jumped into a thick bush. Snap, crackle, my foot got tangled in its branches. I cried, help, I've been swallowed by a bush. We haven't finished our story yet, so what do we do? 
What happened next? After I screamed, I've been swallowed by a bush. So now we have our next part. Are we going to have a someone said something, someone thought something, or somebody did something? And now, from the story that was told, the dad came over and pulled the branches aside and pulled out his foot. So we're just going to put the dad here. Maybe here's some hands. And here's the foot. And here's the bush. So he pulled out, he pulled those branches apart so I could pull out my foot. What do we do? We need to form this sentence. How do we do that? We go back and reread. When we come to the sentence, what do we say? Who's doing the action? What did they do? So let's go back. One day at the lake, I darted around tall trees, climbed up a big rock, and then jumped into a thick bush. Snap, crackle, my foot got tangled in its branches. I cried, help, I've been swallowed by a bush. Who's doing the action? My dad. What did your dad do? My dad pulled apart the branches so I could pull out my foot. I keep saying pulled. What's happening? Redundant please, redundant please. Good writers don't keep using the same words. I said pulled, pulled. You don't want to keep saying the same word over and over again. Let's go back and fix that. Take away one of the pulled. So we have, who's doing the action? My dad, what did he do? He pulled apart the branches and then what? And then my foot was still caught in the branches or free? So again, I give two choices if they can't come up with the language. <gasps> free, all right, so let's say it. My dad pulled apart the branches and my foot was free. I'm just going to start with my. We're not going to put a transition there. My story's done. So I don't have any more actions, I'm free. We have our story opening. Mm -hmm. We have our actions, actions, actions. The story is done. So when our story is done, we can have a secret formula for our story closing. And our secret formula is T-C-R. And then I have the kids go, what does that mean? Thank you for asking. T is for transition. And we know what are transition? Fancy words that move you from one action to the next action. What are transitions? Fancy words that move you from one action to the next action. So we need to get from this action to our ending action. So our fancy words, what we can use there is in the end, finally, looking back, after that day, once I was safe. So there's a bunch of different ways to end our story. Maybe I'm going to use looking back. How about we do that? Who's doing the action? Who's reflecting? So character is, I am. R is reflection. I'm going to go back in the story, and after what happened to me, I'm going to reflect, and I'm going to tell you what I thought, what I felt, or what I learned. So reflection means I, or the main character, goes back in the story and thinks, what did I learn? What did I wish? Or how did I feel about these actions after they happened to me? So once this event, this experience happened to me, what did I wish? Like a thinking bubble. Touch your forehead like you're thinking and say, what did I learn? Or touch your heart. What did I feel? And I'll say, looking back, let's try all three. Looking back, I felt lucky to have such a strong dad. Looking back, I learned, don't jump off big rock. Looking back, I wished I could grease my boots so I wouldn't get stuck into anything when I run around in the woods. Now we have all these different ways that we could say this. The kids talk to each other and they're going to choose the one they like or, and this is what you really want, you want them to come up with their own. I'm going to go back and I'm going to have, looking back, I learned my dad, maybe I'll show muscles here, I have a really strong dad. so. Looking back, I learned to always be with my dad because he's really strong and can save me. We have our ideas, we have our story opening, our actions, and the story is done. And what are we going to do once we have all of our ideas here? We will go back, we will get our red pens or crayons and say, punctuation time! We already put the punctuation on the first sentence, but let's go to the next sentence. Snap! Crackle! 
wait a minute, emphatic statement. Those are sound effects. They can stay on their own. So we're going to capitalize snap, crackle, and put an exclamation point. How do we start this next sentence? Snap, crackle, my foot. So what word are we going to use? My, capitalize my here. Foot got tangled in the branches. I cried. Let's just put our I cried, our comma, and make sure we have all of our punctuation with the red marks so that we can remember when we go back to check that we have that those capitals and those punctuation marks on our paper. We have our my. My dad, oh, this isn't a transition. We just started the sentence with my, because you don't always need a transition. My dad pulled apart the branches and my foot was free, period. Looking back, so we have our L. Looking back, that's my transition, so I need a comma. I learned my dad was a very strong man and could save me, period. So we have our quotation marks, we have our punctuation marks, our capitalization. Last thing we want to do is we want to go back. We already did this with the first sentence, but do we want to go back and add fancy words? So let's look at our second sentence. My foot got tangled in its branches. What would be important? Probably branches. Snap, crackle, my foot got tangled in. What kind of branches would my foot get tangled in? Well, was there just one or a bunch of them? A bunch of them. So let's put a bunch. So we'll put bunch. Snap, crackle, my foot got tangled in a bunch of branches. We have I cried, help, I've been swallowed by a bush. Maybe we can describe bush if we do that. Maybe I've been swallowed by a hungry bush. That could be funny. It depends if you want to write that or not. And my what kind of da dad would come and pull apart a branch? So is dad important to describe? Yes. Pull apart the branches and my foot was free. Ooh, maybe I should describe my foot too. That seems important to describe. So what kind of dad would pull apart the branches? Am I going to use five senses, his personality, or would I use his emotions? What kind of personality? I think we're going to describe his personality. My kind. Dad, let's do that. My kind dad pulled apart the branches and my what kind of foot would be free? My swollen foot was free. Looking back, I learned my dad was brave and was always there to save me. So we have our describing words. We have our punctuation. We have all of our actions. We have our story opening actions, our story closing, and the kids are rehearsing their organizer over and over. The children who are fluently rehearsing it, and remember, every time they rehearse it, they can change it up a little as long as it sticks with the story and it makes sense. They don't need to say the exact words that you've been saying. Every time I say it, I say it a little differently. I'm showing them I'm thinking about the picture, and when I say it differently, it's because I can make the sentence better. I'm revising through my rehearsals. So we keep orally rehearsing it over and over and over, and then what happens? I tell children who are fluently saying it with ease to go ahead and start writing. So they start writing, and they have a writing paper with a rectangular square, a yellow rectangular square, so that they always indent. Eventually, they don't need the square. Once they just have practiced so many times of indent indenting, they don't need this anymore. They just do it naturally. But you don't want them to not indent and then later have them fix it because then they practice doing it wrong and it's really difficult to change that habit. So you always have them do it correctly. So now you have your paper. They're orally rehearsing it. How do they orally rehearse it? They have their paper, their writing paper next to their planner. They say their sentence, then they write it down. While they're writing down their sentence, they say it as they write. Then they go back, they repeat the sentence that they just wrote, they repeat the whole organizer. So they did the story opening, they wrote it down. And as they write it, they write it down and say it. Then they go back, they say the story opening, and now they're rehearsing and practicing the second sentence. Once it sounds pretty good, they go back, they reread their story opening, and say that second sentence. You keep doing this. They're talking, talking, talking. They're rehearsing, rehearsing as they write, as they write 
over and over again throughout their paper. When they're finished, they count all the different punctuation, they match it up. Once you have dialogue, it's better for them to do it sentence by sentence. And what I mean by that is this. First, you can just have them count how many st stops, periods, and exclamation points, and if there were question marks, were in their writing. Then they go back and count and make sure that that's there. But the next thing that I usually do once they get to this level, because there's so much punctuation, is I have them do touch points. And that's where they're going to touch the first word of each sentence. So they touch one. Then they touch the period at the end of that sentence. Now they say the sentence and then they go to their writing and they make sure they have the capital there. They say the sentence and make sure that it ends with the stop. And then they also go back and see in that where they've touch point that sentence, do they have one, two, three commas? Do they have the three commas? They go back and check and count. Then they go to the next sentence and they touch point them so that they're actually identifying that sentence and they isolate it. So then they check for the capital and stop and if there's any commas in there, then they're gonna check for that as well. What if in my sentence I had some capitalization, like there was a proper noun? We would color code that red and then they would go back and make sure that they had that, red, that capital in their sentence as well. So they would isolate these sentences in their writing, look at their organizer for the punctuation and make sure it matches in their writing. There's our organizer, here's our plan. Now, when I did this with you, I knew my story because it was a personal narrative. If it's a personal narrative, you tell the story, then you follow the steps to write it down. If it's an imaginative story, then what you do is follow the steps and it'll create a story. Either way, these steps work. We finished with this activity. Go back, grab a new piece of paper, see if you can follow the steps and write your own story. Good luck and I hope you enjoy it.